Hey, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us here on our ESPN Esports Valorant show. Arda, Emily, Tyler, Jacob with you every single Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on ESPN Esports Twitch. If you joined us on Monday for our 12-hour live stream, our ESPN Esports Valorant launch special, thank you very much. Whether you joined us for a minute or all 12 hours, we very much appreciate your support. If you missed it entirely, pretty much all of the 12 hours in segments is now available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash ESPN Esports. Tons of conversations, whether it's with developers, the head of Esports for Valorant, with pro players, with casters, a meta conversation. We have a whole lot of content that you can catch up on after this program. Just head on over to our YouTube channel. So the launch occurs on June 2nd, ladies and gents. We've had a chance to play a little bit. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. We've won a ton of games. We won't talk about anything else in terms of losing games because that definitely didn't happen, stricken from the record. Uh, but let's get some general thoughts so far on the updates from the closed beta and also the new character Reyna and the new map Ascent. What are our top level thoughts, Emily, so far on playing Valorant on launch day and beyond? Uh, so playing it or on the launch? Because I have a lot of opinions, separate opinions on the launch. But I mean, no, you're, playing, you're it, playing it, um, it yourself, yeah. I, I like Ascent. Um, I think the middle part, like, uh, takes some getting used to because that's where you can really, like, pop off with an op. Um, and so, uh, I still haven't learned, I think, the intri in intricacies of how to navigate that with a team yet, but I actually really like that map. It's been a lot of fun to play, especially, uh, since the maps were kind of, uh, and I think Jacob has also said this too, I think the maps were kind of the weakest part of the beta since there was like a, they, they kind of got a little, a little boring, a little stale after a while. Uh, I also like the split updates, honestly. Like I know yeah. people still have really varying opinions on split. I actually like it a lot now. Um, what do you like, like about it? it? Uh, I like that it's more open in that midsection because it forces you to, uh, come up with specific strategies around it like in the games we were playing last night for example um i think that i i like how how much bigger it is i think it also um even though it might skew slightly still i think it's a lot more even than it was on launch and i'm glad that they listened to a lot of that criticism and, and adjusted it i actually like it uh better than than bind now uh, I think Bind is kind of boring at this point. Um, <laughs> I still really love Haven, but but Bind is kind of my least favorite map now. Uh, and Split has has bumped it bumped it down just uh, due to the changes that they made on it. Um, I haven't played Reyna myself yet. I've played against her, uh, and she seems very. Uh, and I know uh, some others in this have played her, so they I'll I'll go to them in a minute. But she feels very like uh feast or famine almost like uh other other characters or agents we've talked about previously where you can do super super well on her um if you don't know how to play her it's going to be a rough like getting to the point where you do know how to play her comfortably it's probably going to be a rough time but if you can get through that uh she's incredibly powerful yeah, you, you've d described Reyna as feast or famine when we've been playing Tyler. And uh, yeah. yeah, for me, it's like if you're really good at gunfights, if you're mm -hmm. confident that you'll be able to click your opponent's head faster than your opponent will click your head, then Reyna is excellent. If you are 50-50 or less, Reyna's pretty rough. That's my, that's my initial impression of Reyna. Yeah, I mean... Yeah... Uh... Uh, when I'm thinking about Reyna, she is very much a uh, divide-and-conquer sort of agent. But as a whole, I've, I've actually really enjoyed it thus far. I think Ascent is an interesting map. Uh, it's a, The mid is very interesting, uh, with the wiener dog and the, the very open space. <laughs> you have the two doors, so you have the two, you know, uh, uh, separate entrances that can be blocked off. It's, it's a really interesting map. I think mid is really going to show us some interesting skirmishes again i need to play a lot more of it uh obviously you have the two main entrances into a and b which are very uh short corridors with the orbs kind of setting up these you know these very close quarter gunfights 
which can cause some, you know, standoffs where I've seen some games of, you know, more high level players where it's a lot of 1v1s, 1v2s trying to fight over the orb and then trying to get through to the site uh, by the, you know, the other, by going through mid because it's just so close up. If you try to just bunch through those short corridors, you just get blown up very easily. Ascent, very, I would say, eh. It's it's a good map. I need to play more of it. I don't think it's you know a world stopper. I don't think it's the perfect map. I still think Haven is the best created map, and I still have the most fun on Haven. Uh, overall, I think I've had a lot of fun so far. Uh, I think the biggest thing is that the FPS drops have been I don't want to say perfected because I'm sure there still is a minority having those drops and they're still having those issues. But overall, I'm seeing a lot of positivity through the community. A lot of like the like the Mendos and a lot of the top level players who are playing this at a pro level, their you know FPS is seem to be like doing well. So overall, like I'm having a lot of fun with it. I still want to play a lot more just to see you know Reyna set and try to get more of a grasp on it. But I I would give uh you know eight out of ten nine out of ten good good launch personally for me, and we'll talk about it as a you know overarching launch in a minute. Yeah, definitely. I feel like we we got a good offering at launch. We got an extra agent. We got an extra map. And you definitely feel the range vibes if you haven't played yep. Ascent yet. And I, I think Chad is saying that I might have a little bit of a delay from my video to audio. And I apologize. We'll try our best to fix it. It might be internet connectivity issues. Well, we'll just power through here. Uh, Ascent definitely has the range vibes there. You see parts of it uh, that you would have uh, been familiar with if you played the range at all, the practice area, and also the doors. What I found very surprising, actually, were how uh, weak the doors were. They're actually weaker than Sage's barrier orb, even with the barrier orb nerf, even with the wall nerf. They're not the that much are... different from like the doors on the teleporter, though, uh, on Haven. Are those, like, are, are those breakable? Yeah, sorry, the, gar I'm the garage. Fine. And the garage. Are, are the doors, teleport sorry, and the garage doors too, yeah. You, you can yeah. spam them, but you can't break them, right? Yeah, you can't just break them. Clearly. You can't, yeah. bre yeah, you can't break ones, them, but yeah. yeah. They're, they're about the same about the same hit, Reg, I think. It, it takes about the same okay. amount of bullets to pierce. Well, I so think it's with fine. The doors, though, you can break them. And no, I think it's, it, they're it's pretty, fine. It's only like three knife uh, attacks. Yeah, okay. through. You kind of have to, right? Because if you yeah. if they're super hard to take down, then you literally have to go through the short corridor if they close the door, right? Where it makes it an almost impossible to attack on that map. If you if you had to do like you know ten shots into the the door to get it down, you're you're done. You'd have to go barrel through the short corridor where you're just gonna get popped you, most of the time. Do you think that mm -hmm. there should be more than two doors? There's there's one door per site basically on ascent to block off one way for. Uh, a t a defenders or attackers to get in in order I, to uh, to get to site. I think like a mid door might be interesting to mm -hmm. you know kind of block off the mid if that was possible. I would have to think about it more. Just spitballing, like if there was going to be a third door that's closed off, it would be mid because you have one A, one B going into those sites. So I, I actually I think we need a lot more play, right? I hope Twitch rivals this weekend. We're going to probably see a lot of ascent, hopefully. And we'll see it more of a high level of, you know, is it defense, you know, focus, attack focus. We'll see where it kind of shakes out. But let's see some of the pros play first. And then next week, we'll, we'll have a better understanding of Ascent as a map. Well, if the game is exactly as is for Twitch Rivals and it's not customized in any way, they're going to get a lot of Ascent maps because as we <laughs> heard in our launch invitational, uh, that is deliberate. You are going to get more Ascent maps because they want you to play Ascent. So that's going to happen at least for the foreseeable future, maybe a week or two, who knows. But definitely, at least now, if you're playing Valorant, your chances are it's a higher percentage to get on Ascent than any other map. Uh, we talked briefly about Reyna. Uh, let's ask this question, Emily. Let's start with you. Based on some of the players that you've seen, uh, definitely the duelists that are out there among pro players, what kind of pros do you see succeeding with Reyna and possibly changing to become a Reyna main? Uh, I'm not really sure, but I mean, anyone who re really wants like a high caliber duelist is going to be good at Reyna. Like I know people were pointing out tens, uh, the tens clip that I think Tyler yep. tweeted earlier. Um, but anyone who tends towards, I honestly think as weird as this sounds, because their kits are very different, but people who really tend to prefer someone like Jet, I think is going to do really, really well on Reyna actually. Um, just because of a uh, not similar play style, but I think uh, 
I just think a lot of the snap decision making and the willingness to go in, if you are good at jet, that timing has to be really impeccable. Uh, and I feel uh, this uh, in, like I feel similarly about Reina, which is why I think she's going to be um, again, like there's going to be a slightly longer learning curve for her. But once people figure her out, I think we'll have actually some some nerfs to her kit uh, once we see more people being able to play her to a high level. Uh, by the way, one quick, uh, I love, I don't normally main Jet, but I love Jet on Spike Rush. And let me tell you why. I, I, I'm awful. I hate the Marshall. Hate yes. it with all of my, the, every fiber of my being. The worst Marshall gun. is the worst gun to ever be created in any video game ever. I hate it. That's how much that's how much vitriol I have for this lousy, stupid, ridiculous, unnecessarily gun. Okay? But usually when I get the Marshall and Spike Rush, hopefully I'm either close to or have activated an ultimate. So with Jet, that nullifies the need for the Marshall. So that's why I say thank you to Jet during Spike Rush, especially especially on Marshall rounds. Because the Marshall sucks! Oh, that's all I have to say about that. Marshall's the worst. Anyhow, uh, so that's our thoughts on Ascent, our thoughts on Reyna as well. Uh, any other changes? Uh, Jacob, I know your beloved Sage has been nerfed. Has that caused uh, you to uh, rethink who you will main now? I mean, both my characters got nerfs towards either during this patch or, or towards the end of beta. The other, my my secondary is Cypher. And I mean, I still think Sage provides like really good utility. In my opinion, right? Like she is, she's a character to me. And again, again I know br I bring Apex up all the time, but like I played a ton of Pathfinder who got really hard nerfed into the ground this year in Apex. And like, I feel similarly about Sage. They just, their their kit is so... Their kit is so valuable even when they are like underpowered from like a raw uh, skill or from a raw like skills perspective. But what they're able to do is like so unique that it there's nothing to replace them. So I mean, that's kind of how I feel about Sage. I feel that way about things like Morg and Thresh, like I've said before in, in League of Legends. Like there aren't characters in the game that have similar skill sets like those. So she may not like may not be the the best character in the game right now i'd probably tip that hat to breach uh, or someone as similar um but nonetheless like i i still think she's incredibly valuable especially when you're playing with people you know and you're able to like communicate like you having the healer having the res is super important any other final thoughts on just uh the gameplay before we move on to the news tyler uh, i played a bunch of her and i think I do agree with Emily on the point that it is a very uh, on-your-feet kind of agent where you have to think of split-second decisions. I think the biggest difference is that Jet is a lot... All the top pros, like uh, like Tens, are playing her as an operator, where you can't really mm -hmm. play operator as Reyna, where you're playing much more... Clo you're, you're basically ice skating when you're when like when you're playing Reina at her best. You're kind of ice skating with her uh, intangibility, her you know her. Uh, what do you call when you basically you get her your e when you get a kill and you're basically invulnerable for three seconds you're skating through getting information get that's when the reign is at her best right where she's picking up kills divide and conquer 1v1 duels winning duel after duel after duel and she's skating through for e and q you know healing up and skating through the enemies so i would think you know riflers and people who are playing that kind of role would you know fit into the more that reign of position i think if I think a lot of Phoenix players will pick up Reyna, I think uh, Reyna might be a better version of Phoenix currently with, you know, her leer and her kind of her, you know, moving through the opponent and kind of just taking it out 1v1 as a duelist. I think Jet has her spot. I think Jet and Rays are way more comparable since they're the more mobile uh, duelist where they have, you know, you can whiz around the map with the statues or obviously Jet, whose main kit is all about her speed. So I think we'll see a lot more rain. Uh, if we'll see a lot more Phoenix mains, probably go to Reina, where I think you know Jet and Ray's you know mains are playing with the op or playing more mobile will keep on those agents. I, I do want to see how pros use the leer, which is the eyeball that Reina shoots out to make every opponent nearsighted if they see it. It is a destructible eye, by the way, so you can shoot yeah. it and the effect will go away. But I'd love to see where the pros place it. 
because right now I'm using it very linearly and I feel like that's not enough. So I'd Most love people, to see. You Most know pros I mean? are doing what you're doing. Most pros are just throwing it out. I mean, because they can't, they can't, you know, they can't blind your team, which is the best part. I mean, for yeah. lower elo, it's the best part of Lear Ray is that you can't yeah. blind your team. Unlike yeah. the the Phoenix Flash, where every you know silver <laughs> below Phoenix player flashes the team on every entry. Hey, at least, at least you at least you can blind other people, not not your own. So that yeah, yeah, yeah that's a nice uh, nice perk. Yeah, nice perk. Nothing else. So as the game got released on June 2nd, of course, Twitch Rivals is going to happen this weekend, the first major tournament since the global release. And we will talk about that in a little bit, but we've gotten some news as well. A couple of signings to discuss. <laughs> I see Epic Han uh, Brolo, uh, Brolo TTV in chat saying, Saw Scott got signed to T1. Yeah, they're pretty set up. So let's unpack that. Skadoodle was one of the last major names that had really garnered attention in the closed beta in Valorant. And there was a lot of conversation there about where will Skadoodle go? And he ends up going to the team that has basically, you could say, invested the most in Valorant so far. They were the earliest adopters, and they've brought on quite a few big names onto their roster uh, and a little bit of a reunion as well with Skadoodle uh, coming there, Jacob. Uh, when you first heard this news, was it surprising to you or perhaps with the teammates already there, was this a foregone conclusion in your opinion? Well, if you remember, I was talking on Monday. I said that uh, this was what, who I thought would be... I, I said from a skill perspective, this is the best fit for them of available players. I thought that Hiko would have been a better fit from a shot calling perspective because he's much more of a voice. If you're unfamiliar with Skadoodle, as someone who spent a lot of time around him, Skadoodle is incredibly smart. That's why he's been such a good Counter-Strike player. His like game IQ is off the charts. What he's not so great at is communication. He's a very quiet, sort of shy guy. Not rude or anything. I don't want to make it seem like he's a jerk. He actually he's a really nice dude when you have a conversation with him, but he's not he doesn't he's not like Hiko, who's like very much loud and and sort of aggressive in calls. And I I kinda thought that's what T one needed was a shot caller. Um, versus, you know, somebody else who kinda uh, you know, like doesn't contribute in the same way he does speak but he he's not like he's not loud and aggressive he kind of just does his thing and focuses which is fine um i think skadoodle's an incredibly talented player and to your point like this is a little bit of the i buy power reunion and like you know a lot of people get frustrated because they've heard the i buy power story over and over again so we're not gonna like have to dive into what happened there but it, essentially like those guys prior to being banned by valve were on a hot streak together uh azk brax and skadoodle they were you know, it's the only and the only reason Skadoodle, Skadoodle didn't get banned is because he didn't accept the skins uh, in all of that. That's why he was able to go on to play for C9 and win a, a world championship in Counter Strike um, and have such incredible performances on that Cloud9 team. Um, but I, I think the big thing now is like this team clearly gels well, very or gels very well together. I'm interested to sort of see how Food and Crashies uh, sort of fit in with the, the three-fifths of, of the former I Buy Power team from a personality perspective. I would expect well, or they probably wouldn't be on this team. And I would bet that Brax has had a lot of input uh, since being there for, you know, he was there months even before they signed AZK as well. So um, nonetheless, like, I think this team has the potential to be one of the best Valorant teams uh, in the early pro scene, um, if they're not already on that trajectory. And I, I like taking this approach, all former CS guys versus the Sentinels approach of random sort of hodgepodge uh, of various different games, Apex, Overwatch, Counter-Strike, etc. Um, I, yeah, so I like, I like this approach better. And I think that like the history between uh, Skadoodle, AZK, and, and Brax like kind of speaks for itself. They they all got along. Um, there was not like a really bad falling out at, at the end of I by Power. It just it, what happened happened, you know. So, but I think they I think they will gel pretty well immediately. And we've already seen them playing in tournaments together, uh, ours included, um, and yes. as an unofficial team. So I think they'll do pretty well. Tyler, you think? Do you like this I by Power re, uh, mini reunion here happening at T1 in Valorant? Yeah, I think it's a really cool story. Uh, I talked to Brax a few days ago, uh, working on a feature with him, and we talked about, you know, the incident and him having to watch Skadoodle go to Cloud9, right? And in his mind, it ate at him, because he knew he was still playing counter at the time, and he was beating these players. He was beating these players who would go on to become world champions, and he had to sit there 
not allowed to play pro, watching one of his friends become a world champion without him, and he had nothing, he could do nothing. Like, it wasn't that he failed as a, he didn't fail on the pro stage, he got banned. And he was never, de- he was defeated by Valve and himself, not any player. So that's what really hurt him. Now, you know, five years later, it's kind of the ultimate run back. Obviously, Days and Steel would have made it the true ultimate run back, but you have three of a majority of the I Buy Power team, Ska, AZK, and Brax, and then two of these, you know, you know, rising rookies or rising young talents in, you know, the Tier 2 CS scene in NA with Food and Crashies. And it's a really interesting mix. And just think of, like, if this team goes to the World Championship, it's going to be a really big moment. I'm sure people from Counter-Strike, even if people from Counter-Strike don't like Valorant, and I understand those point of views if they just don't like watching it, but you know for a fact if this team makes it to a final of a World Championship or makes a deep run, people are going to be tuning in to see the story come to a conclusion because this is one of the biggest stories in esports history. We can't overlook it. These guys... The, the 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 Richard Lewis article and everything that went around it was gigantic. Even yeah. from a ca- even back then when I was a casual CS:GO viewer, it took over. Even as a League of Legends reporter back then, it was it took over the entire scene. It was gigantic. So this is a huge kind of who would have thought five years ago that these three players would be playing on a Riot FPS game on SKT T1. It's it's a ridiculous thought five years ago, but here we are, and it's gonna be very fun to watch them. Are you spoiling the existence of a Valorant World Championship? There will be a Valorant World Championship. I, it, it, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I, I did find it interesting in my discussion with Waylon Roselle this past week that he he like made it very clear. There will be first-party tournaments uh, in, in right. Valorant. And it's like, uh, okay, okay. Like, whoa, I, know, I know, know what that much. means. Do we have some breaking news here? <laughs> Valorant World. Valorant I mean, World Championship I mean, this year. Foregone Not this year, version, right? Okay, uh, pick a year. Pick uh, honestly, next year. Emily, next year. Emily, Emily, next year. Emily okay, yeah. so Tyler, you say 2021. Emily, yeah. what year? What year? The first official I mean, Valorant World Championship. I would say 2021, but it won't be at the end of the year. It'll be like mid-year because they <sighs> won't want it to run World, into yeah. uh, League of Legends Worlds, which is like the premier. Like at this point, it's the premier uh, esports. Yeah. event i would say outside of like maybe a few csgo majors let's say july 2021 first world championship i'll book it right here i i'm not do, buying do that. you i mean i i don't know there's so many like lack of space on the calendar though right like july seems yeah. terrible because it's a it backs up to esl1 cologne right which is like one of the three biggest cs events of the world every single year so it's like hmm there, there's like very limited space where it could happen and yeah. not clash. You do not want to put it up against a big Counter Strike tournament, in my opinion, because there is going to be a, a pretty sizable overlap of viewership between CS and Valorant. So I feel like if you're scheduling, if you're Riot and you're scheduling this event, look at maybe like spring, like after after whatever a spring major will be. But you know, if the spring major is like February or March, you right like to, after, uh, after that a- April R6. and. R6 yeah, but, has February. Okay, whatever. I, 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 I say that, like, I like Rainbow Six, but I don't think Riot gives a crap about Rainbow Six. I think they care about Counter-Strike, though. Like, yeah, I, I was going to say, like... they're going to want to avoid CS. Just be, like, not only because CS majors are just massive events, but also because that's the most direct comparison with Valorant, so you might have a viewership crossover problem. But then they want to avoid their own game in yeah. League of Legends. And they want to avoid the international because I think, you know, everyone tunes into the international, even casual Dota people like me. So we so, shall see. Yeah. I 2021, 2021 for me seems too soon with everything yeah. that's going on in the world. We won't have a so. full year of competition. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I it wasn't it wasn't too soon for the season one world championship yeah. for League of Legends. In nah, but we've learned so much since then. I don't bl- buy it. I'm saying 2022 in the spring. That's what I'm saying. Okay. I'm saying give it some time, and I believe spring 2022 is when we will see the first. Wor- I think we need at least. I mean, don't you feel like we need at least eight months to a year of official riot franchised or whatever it's going to be? Let's just call it franchised play before we get to a world championship. No, I, don't know. I think I think they'll just do third party tournaments until they have like a smaller yeah, 
Okay, big so third-party we'll, tournaments are coming, so we'll we'll see that very soon. Okay, we'll, we'll get back on track here in a second, but yeah, maybe they'll have like a third-party champ championship, call that the first one, and then go into their first-party era. Maybe that's how they'll do it. But anyway, that's a conversation for another day. Hiko signs with 100 Thieves. Hiko was one of the other major names that was out there. People were wondering where Hiko would go. People were asking what took so long. Captain Clutch signs with 100 Thieves. So that's an interesting one in the sense that 100T uses this opportunity to enter the Valorant competitive space. Of course, they already have a relationship with Riot competing in the LCS as an academy team as well. But uh, Tyler... Kiko being the first choice here for 100 Thieves, what does that mean for their philosophy on, on how they're going to build a Valorant team? It's a brilliant move by 100 Thieves, and I, I think Jacob can speak more on this after this, is that when people thought of like who should be the face of 100 Thieves Valorant, because we knew it was coming, they were very active in the space, doing a lot of videos, doing their own tournament, who is going to be that face? And I think a lot of people said Ska, right? Like, Ska will be the face. He'll be the content creator. He can be the pro slash content creator. And Jacob has said that Ska is a very shy guy. Hiko's not shy. He's a very social, very funny. We've seen on his stream, he's killing it. He, he's gone from, you know, a few thousand stream, like a, like one, two, three K. Now he gets like 15 to 20 K per stream. He's, he's, he's killing it. He's the main valorant content creator in north america right now and it's not only that he's a brilliant player we've seen him in beta tournaments he's an amazing breach player he's my personal best breach in the world during beta and if you want one player to kind of build his own team giving the keys to one player to just kind of build out the stack you give it to hiko and i and i know i believe this deal was probably uh, a few weeks ago or it's been in the making because i know for like I've, I've been told by you know sources that they were looking at ska maybe ska and hiko obviously t1 got ska but now you have hiko as your kind of your crown jewel and you get to build a team around him and he gets to you know kind of pick his team so oh it's gonna be really fun i'm happy where everything landed up i'm happy ska and hiko are on different teams because i think that makes t1 the most interesting story that they could be and now hiko gets to build his own team which is going to be super super exciting so, yeah, on that point, right, like, a couple things. Uh, first, shout out to Hiko in that video, because my man looks great. Uh, I know that he was he was uh, sort of, like, yeah, giving us a little bit of grief for using old photos of him uh, for when he was a pro in CS, because uh, he's had so much weight loss success. So, shout outs, shout outs to Hiko as someone who has done that. That is a golf clap for the boy. Um, so, the other part of that uh, is, um, I think, to Tyler's point, like, he goes always wanted to build a team. That kind of was his thing, right? Like, if you remember, there was a period in between when he was on Cloud9 and uh, before he joined Liquid, he was, like, talking about trying to recruit Skadoodle and, like, Makalele and build a team in North America for CS. Like, this guy has always wanted to be a leader and put things together. That's sort of, like, what he does. And he was never really given that exact opportunity in, in Counter-Strike. He got it in sort of small tidbits. But, like, even when he went to Liquid, he he had Nitro and Elite, who are, like, the you know, sort of the staples of that Team Liquid Counter-Strike team. Um, so I think sort of giving him the keys is pretty smart, even from a branding perspective, right? Like, that's what something 100 Thieves does really well is sort of emboldening people. That's what they do really well with Nade Shot, right? Like... Yeah, Nate Shot's involved in decision making, and he's the CEO and the founder of 100 Thieves. But like, Nate Shot's not the only business guy in the room. Every time 100 Thieves makes a decision, they actually have a pretty robust organization. But like, you probably don't know that if you don't follow close attention, because Nate Shot they do a good job of elevating Nate Shot uh, overall, right? And I think they'll do the same with Hiko um, in terms of making him team leader and sort of like taking his input. And uh, yeah, he he is like this is the perfect career revival for him, right? Like he like. He didn't really have anywhere he could have gone in, in CS any longer. Um, I think that, you know, there, maybe it was skill, maybe it was, like, people didn't want to play with him, whatever it may be. Like, his time in CS was more or less over in the pro scene. And, like, this is perfect for him. He's very, he's clearly very good at Valorant. We've seen him play. He he is a skilled player. He's a big personality. He He's a good streamer. Like, he fit, he crosses off all the 100 Thieves, like, boxes that you would consider for that organization and the types of people they like to work with. So I think it's a great move for him and a great move for them. So my answer to this question that I'm going to pose to you all as well, what names left unsigned out there are you keeping an eye on? For me, it's Corey. Yeah. I think that's the obvious answer as yeah. well, but he's, I I'm actually shocked that 
of I would clump the three of them together, Scududo, Hiko, and Corey. Like, what took everybody so long? Unless they were taking their time because they yeah. were getting so many offers. But well, I, I mean, have to uh, imagine. Yeah, by now, I was, I was gonna say. Corey I feel like you like, just. I feel you like said you just it. Answered your own question. I, I feel like by now Corey <laughs> must have at least five offers, five major offers that he's contemplating. Yeah, like he's... I have to think. Yeah, I my guess. Yes. Emily? yes. Yeah, I was gonna say like I think Corey is just probably deciding where he wants to go at this point. Uh, like I don't yeah. think it's that he hasn't received offers. I think it's more about like what he wants to do, what kind of team he wants to build on, how much control he wants to have over picking his teammates. Uh, Because that's really big as well. Like, we just talked about the Hiko signing. Like, I've said in the past, like, Hiko would be my first signing. And then I would just let him build, basically, like, let him build a team for me almost, right? So, um, I think, I'm sure Corey has many, many offers. And it's just a matter of, how A, how much money he wants, and B, who he wants to play with. I think I think the other thing too is will for a hundred thieves like will they decide to go the full CS route or will they try to do sort of the mixed bag? Um, the full the the full CS route uh, it bag is is drawing very slim here at this point in my opinion, right? Like I freak thought that we yeah, yeah freak uh, and freak and Hiko have gotten <laughs> along in the past, so it's certainly possible. And Freakazoid's brother, I think potentially. I know he, he was a pro CS guy also. Um, my thought though is that they probably should look elsewhere because like if you look at it like tsm got wardell and hayes and cutler um you look at t1 and they got sort of the, the top line of people transitioning um yeah I, I think it's it's best to sort of just like go off the beaten path um very small amount of people that will make this transition uh without the, the right offer and, and like we said there's not very much incentive to leave counter-strike if you're a big uh, big name. Somebody said nothing in the chat. That would make sense. Nothing in Hiko or friends. Um, you know, someone, someone like that makes a lot of sense to me, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm not so certain nothing will be one of the best in this game long-term. I'm not so certain that Hiko will be one of the best in this game long-term, but I think even if he isn't like being on hundred thieves, there's so many endless opportunities. Yeah. Content so, creator. Yeah. Tons of opportunities. Well, we're going to be monitoring that. We talk about that every single week, every time there is a signing or even a rumored signing. We talk about it on the program every single Thursday. Hit that follow button, by the way. If you haven't, you hit the heart on this channel. You're already following our Twitch channel. So thank you very much for doing that. Twitch Rivals, speaking of Twitch, is happening from Friday to Sunday, the first major Valorant tournament since the global launch. Uh, North America and Europe other regions involved as well. Let me start with North America. The first thing that jumped out at me, Tyler, was the prize pool. $42,000 total prizing for North America. I know that there are two European regions, but it's more than double that for Europe, uh, which I found very peculiar. So there's the format here. There's 80, t 80 um, players, 16 teams, five players per team, of course. It's going to be Saturday and Sunday for North America. There's the finals prizing, eight grand for top spot, five grand for second place. Uh, and you have the groups there. And the groups have been announced. Uh, so group A is Team Myth and Team 10. So there's like a mixture of of different players and content creators. Uh, and, and you can see like Myth has Wardell on his team and Subroza on his team. Uh, he, there's a Team Hiko. There's a Team Dizzy. When you look at this, though, Ty, are you surprised uh, that North America comparatively has a lower prize pool? I, I guess. I mean, it might be because they're giving, I, I don't know how many people are in Europe, in the European. I don't know if it's a if you just straight double, but it you, know, you, get, you get money for losing. So that's a thing. North America, I, I, I would say, by far has the better field. It, it's a lot of pro players. Like if I was going to recommend to watch one of these you know, Twitch rivals, it would easily be North America because the European one has, I think it has the Scream team, which is like Scream and Draken and, and Artis and Mixwell. And then there's one with the Fish 1, 2, 3 guys plus on screen. And those two teams are so much better than everyone else in that tournament that it's not even going to be fun to watch. Where Twitch rivals, you have in NA, you legitimately have like six or seven really, really good stacks. You have the T1 debut. You have tens and friends who might be the C9, you know, full roster. They already won the rivalry bowl, now playing again in Twitch Rivals. But I think the major thing I look at this is how terrible, how terrible these groups are drawn. If you look at group A and B in, in NA Twitch Rivals and compare it to group C and D, it's really, really bad. 
and it's like astonishingly like bad. Where what do you, you have against Team Austin Creed and Team Jordan Fisher, Tyler? Group uh, D yeah. looks stacked. They're stacked with uh, you know name value. And I'm not saying Jordan Fisher isn't a good player. <laughs> Jordan Fisher is like a legitimately a great player, and I'm sure Austin Creed can do his best. You know, good job Cesaro. You're great. Play that sign in League of Legends. You know, Team WWE, all that. It's all fun, but. Group A and B are so stacked. I had players in, you know, in the tournament, I'm not going to say who, reached out to me and basically said, look at these groups, they're a joke. And they are a joke. The fact that, arguably, you can say, you can make an argument that the top eight teams in Twitch Rivals NA are in group A and B, and then the, the bottom eight teams are all in group C and group D, is really, really weird. And I, and I, I want to know how these were made. It doesn't feel right at all that... that only two of the, the group A and B teams are going to make the semifinals, or a team from group C and D are going to make it as well. It just seems very outlandish. Like, just look at how many good teams are in group A and B and compared to group C and D. It's really, really ridiculous. And I, and this is why I can't take this tournament too seriously, right? Like, it's a streamer tournament for the most part. So, well, yeah. I mean, I, think, I feel I think, that, that that answers, like, why the groups are so skewed. Like, it's I don't... so bad. I, I think it's, like... I'm not defending the decision. Like, I don't think it's fair. I think if you're looking at having a, the most competitive tournament possible, you obviously split up the teams that have been playing together. They're aiming to be professional teams, but I don't see Twitch rivals as something that is really aiming to do that. Like they're aiming to get, you know, as many, as much viewership as possible. Um, they're aiming to kind of put the game on display and, you know, having really popular streamers advance through the bracket helps out a lot with that. So while I'm not defending the decision, I think the reasoning behind it is incredibly obvious. Pretty damn ridiculous that Sentinels is not playing together, right? Like, I don't know if that's their their decision or Twitch's decision. What, what's, what's the verdict? None of them got captain. That's the reason. You have to, like, so what happens, they pick mm. eight captains, and then those captains have to pick an entire yeah. team. So none of the so Sinatra or none of the Sentinels players got captain. If any of the Sentinel players, if Sinatra got captain, he probably would have picked all five Sentinel players. But that's the reason. That, that's I mean that's insane considering T1 gets the full stack this <laughs> this tournament, right? Like, yeah. damn. Brax got an invite. Let, let's talk about this. Uh, any surprises on these teams and any early favorites among these teams? Emily, let's start with you. I mean, I think T1 kind of has to be. A favorite like I don't really looking at the like to to Tyler's point I don't really think that I'm looking at these teams as a like as a as a super serious tournament because of the way they are um, I'm looking at T1 obviously and then I'm also looking at team team quote unquote team tens which is um, C9. basically C9 uh, and this is the roster that we saw do really, really well already together. So it, for me, it's between those two teams. Unfortunately, you know, they're, they're on the same side of the bracket. I don't know how the bracket re if there's like a resorting that works or if they have to go up against each other a lot sooner than they should have to. But, uh, I think it's going to be one of these two teams. Jacob, what about for you? I love that Corey is on. Uh, which team is he on? He's busy. On He's on yeah. Busy's, yeah. Look at this. Look at this team for name Group value. Ridiculous. I like honestly. Yeah. Like, look team. at that. Look at that team. Dizzy, Sinatra, Sick, Corey, and I like Marvid that. Six. Wow. I like that three fifths of TSM are on Team Myth, but I think Myth is not that great at this game. I think he's okay. Right, like, he's, but he's a streamer at the end of the day. He's not a pro versus like Cutler and Sub Rosa um, and Wardell. Uh, I actually do think if you look at Group C, you may be underrating some of them, Tyler. The one that stands out to me is Team Flom, um, with Anger, Hayes, and Flom uh, on that team. And, and Synchdes, right, who uh, played in our tournament, and actually pretty damn good. Um, team Shots has potential to be okay. I actually know that, like, I think Grego may have been a playtester for this at one point, if I'm not mistaken, for Valorant. So he's had his hands hands on for a little bit. Um, and then, you know, Lex, Lex is, uh, very well tenured in Counter-Strike, and if you watch Twitch and NCS, you probably are familiar. Um, I, I mean, team, uh, can anyone but Team Mendo run over Group D? Like, that, that just makes, like, yeah. that makes yeah. the most sense, right? Like, group, group D is the group of, like, Mendo, did Mendo, 
<laughs> did Mendo is 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 Mendo's dad the the uh, the head of Twitch? Because that is a uh, very sick group for Team Mendo. Yeah, and strings terms... were pulled. <laughs> they have Tim the Tap Man, so he is the biggest streamer I think in this event. So uh, that is a fun team though: Moxie, Mendo, Tim the Tap Man, Baby J, Calypso. Uh, I, mean, I think be fun the... to watch. Yeah, no, 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 it'll, it'll be fun. Yeah, it'll, it'll be, be fun. fun. It's not going to be like the most competitive I, uh, yeah. event we could have, but. I, I mean, I think Europe is obviously like a lot weaker, but the one team in Europe that I'm like, in Europe too, at least, that I'm like actually looking forward to is the Team Lothar. If you're mm. familiar with Lothar, he's, uh, he's a former Hearthstone player. He worked in operations at G2, and I've actually been watching him play a pretty decent amount of Valorant, and he's actually pretty damn good. Lothar has been like really good at every game he's touched. So I like. I think that he could be good in uh, in this as well. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think I think Europe wants to wash for Mixwell and Scream. Um, I I think those guys are like, but and, and Pith too, right? Like Chat was saying something about Pith. Like Pith is another one of those guys. This transition room Counter Strike and is gonna have a career resurgence uh, because of it. So like, yeah, I that that team Team Mixwell is ridiculous. With with uh, artists, by the way, who plays on Fish One Two Three, so I'm actually yeah. we're we're seeing a uh, a disbanded Fish One Two Three for one event. Emily, can you believe it? They've they've disbanded for one event. Well, I mean, I think it's it's more because of the the draft. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a feels uh, bad man moment. Yeah, it kind of stinks because I would like <laughs> I love to see them. I love to see them play as a unit as much as possible. So hopefully, someone will pick them up. Please, you're not trying to get anyone. So I mean, there's gonna be 40 NA orgs with Valorant teams before a European team signs. They're, like, they're like, gonna three. sign them and like fly them out yeah. to NA and put them through 14 day quarantine <laughs> and then yeah. have them play in North America. Uh. But this is not surprising, though. Like, Europeans yeah. Europeans in every esports title have always been slow to... Like, European orgs have been slow to the party because they, like, if they are truly European-backed and not owned by a North American team or owned by, uh, like, a Middle Eastern ownership group, right? Like, they are conservative with their money. Like, that's that's mm-hmm. not that's not uncommon at all. We've seen this in esports and sporting history for a long time. It's like, the European teams, you always see, like go out there and go buck wild with their cash or ones that are owned by people who are from the United States or from the Middle East. And that, that's how they invest. They'll throw a billion things at the wall. And if one sticks, they'll be happy. But like if they're European, if they're European or especially right now in the middle of the pandemic, like they're going to be relatively conservative with their money. But I don't see a world where like Scream and Mixwell don't get picked up relatively soon though. Yeah. My team what to watch. I... Um, I was gonna go ahead. Go ahead, Tyler. Watch. Uh, my team to watch, I think, for, for travels, I, I think it's most interesting, is Team Asu. Asu, I thought, like, I thought Energy would be one of the first teams to announce a team. It seems like maybe Asu might not even be a pro player. He might want to just be a pure streamer, a variety streamer that plays a lot of Valorant but doesn't go full streaming, which I think would be a little bit disappointing because I do think he has the potential to be one of the better pros, at least in the beginning of Valorant, and he's such a stylish player that I wish, you know, you could build a team around him, but... Isu, Dapper, which will be one of the first times we get to see Sentinel's new player. Zom, Shazam, so three of the five Sentinel's players. And then the big one, the, you know, the best North American, arguably the best North American player right now. You know, Team Liquid not doing the best at CSGO in the online environment. But Elige, he's back, which is very interesting. The only real, you know, big CS pro who's in this tournament, you know, he played in uh, the Nerd Street T1 tournament, and he was a monster. And now he's back, and I'm very interesting to see how he does in this tournament because Elige is very, very good at shooting at uh, in shooting games, and I'm very excited to see how he does on Team Asu. That's just a lot yeah, of talent. That's a lot of talent. A lot of talent. If if I was like a hundred thieves or one of these orcs trying to get in, I would just go like write a leech the fattest check I ever could, and then like try to like pay off Victor Goosens from Liquid to let him go. Um, I don't think that will happen. I think Elige no. is is got it really good going good for him over at liquid he's been there for a very long time and is valued respected and paid compensated very well um but yeah if i if i'm a if i'm a uh, hundred or a hundred thieves or one of these other orgs and you like you want to spin big and get a good team just go offer a liege a giant yeah. fat stack because that like that's honestly like he he's the one the one person that uh you know even that he's like playing it as a side game right now outside of scrims he's still doing really well which is telling 
So before we get off the topic of Twitch Rivals, and by the way, it's happening this weekend, Friday to the Sunday on twitch.tv slash twitch. So that's where you can watch it all weekend long, Europe and NA, both tournaments running, as well as Korea, by the way. And I know that this is not the first time that he has touched Valorant, Emily, uh, but it's still interesting, is a good word to uh, to use, to see uh, Ryu Jahong play in a tournament like this, of course, he's very well known for playing in Overwatch League, but here he is playing some Valorant. And uh, I wonder, at least you could speculate that maybe he's testing the waters here. What do you think? How far will this go with the Ryu Jahong relationship with Valorant? I mean, I think uh, if you're going to be talking about Jahong moving over, you'd have to include a lot of extra context in terms of how the game is launched in Korea thus far, uh, which I don't know if we're going to get to like a discussion of the overall launch, but I have a lot of opinions on on what's going on because people have been pulling uh, PC bong numbers. but like to start with Ryu Jae-hung first, we already saw him and Eska play uh, old Lunatic High uh, players for people that don't know. Eska was one of the players I really wanted to see pick up Valorant just generally because he's known as like the South Korean FPS player. Um, but I mean, I think uh, if you want to speculate about players leaving whatever game they're playing right now in South Korea... For Valorant, uh, I think you have to look at the overall climate. Thus far, we've only had mm. Tyler. Tyler can correct me on this, but thus far, we have, I, I've only seen one team making the move, and that was MVP as a as a unit. Um, I know that T. I know that T1 and Gen G are both recruiting currently. Yeah. Um, I think the big thing for South Korea and the reason why, like, just just generally. The launch, uh, we'd already talked about this on stream, but it seems like a soft launch overall. A, because China's not included, which would have made a massive difference. But B, because everything was rolled out at different times and all of the hype was around watching beta, right? Like the beta initial launch with drops and stuff was insane, right? Over millions of people watching uh, people play Valorant. And that to me, is kind of the initial launch. Uh, Right now, we've seen it slowly creep up in PC bongs in in South Korea, which is, I'm not going to say PC bong numbers are everything, but it's a really good indicator of gaming trends more than anything else. So just the other day, uh, if you you follow her, she's a a South Korean uh, French broadcaster, uh, Ha Jin Sun. She's she's really great Mm -hmm. just generally. Um, And she's cast in multiple esports, and she released the PC bong numbers and Valorant just crept into the top 10 uh, of most played games in, in PC bongs uh, in South Korea on day three. Uh, to compare, Overwatch had this like massive over the top launch with like events in multiple cities and You know, Blizzard really, really went all out to launch Overwatch in South Korea, which is why we were talking about PC bong numbers around Overwatch's release a ton, right? Because it was the only thing to take down League of Legends, which was huge because League occupies and continues to occupy about 50% of the share. Like 50% of people who are going to PC bongs in South Korea are playing League of Legends. Um, And then next is... But right now, it's next is PUBG, next is Overwatch, next is Sudden Attack, and then all the way down in 10th at 1.19% is Valorant. Um, I don't think this is like, oh my gosh, the sky is falling, everyone hates Valorant in South Korea. I think it's more of a reflection of a few things. One, again, the fact that the launch seemed really soft. So I think, and Hajinson says this in her thread as well, um, I think the big thing is going to be how we see tournaments crop up, how we see uh, third-party events take off. If OGN is going to do something, for example, around this, I think that will be really big, and that will help drive PC Bong numbers, since Riot didn't have as big of a release as as something like Overwatch in South Korea. Um, But then the other thing to remember is that right now, PC Bongs are kind of half-closed, So most people who are uh, like because of the uh, ongoing pandemic, so um, not as many people are going to PC bongs to play. Uh, I think all in all, Valorant could have had a better launch in South Korea. I also think that the comments are really interesting with people saying it's a combination, not of CS and Overwatch, but of sudden attack and Overwatch, which tells you, I think, a lot about what 
uh, FPS games that South Korean uh, people in PC bongs actually do play. Um, but again, I think the, the big thing with Valorant in South Korea for me is going to be uh, these events and any sort of invitationals, possibly the Twitch Rivals thing that's going to go on in South Korea. I know the, um, the, that initial South Korean tournament was watched by a lot of people just because like people like Yu Jae Hong and Esco were playing in it. Um, so if you get events like that, if you get third party events going, if you get some uh, really well known and well respected South Korean organizers like OGN involved, I think it will help drive PC bong numbers. But I also think this is just another reflection of how soft Valorant's launch is yep. worldwide, and also how we are going to be in kind of a like a a lull period as things slowly start to ramp up, as teams are formed, as events happen, and those events will hopefully uh, help drive further and larger numbers for Valorant overall. I mean, also, like, we'd be remiss not to mention, right, not not South Korea, but, like, this has been a, a an odd week to launch with everything going on in the United States and, and exactly, riots, yes. riots, riots and protests, uh, at, Rightly so, um, in in speaking up for against racial injustice and and racism. So you know, it's like we are the least important thing on the totem pole of what's going on yep. in our country right now. Uh, gaming is the, the least important of what's going on in our country right now. There are far more important things going on, and we all recognize that. But like, uh, when it, that has been continually like the the Twitter and news cycle more generally throughout the week, and I, I don't think too many people are talking about video games. So yeah, it it's uh unfortunate timing but yeah you know, we obviously we wish everybody well that that's protesting and, and speaking up and, and families of of uh the folks who have died unfortunately but yeah it, it's a it's an odd week uh for sure yeah that's... uh oh i was go oh, ahead was... tyler no yeah i want to disagree with jacob is that um again we gaming is such a low on the tone pole right now exactly and it's really every it, it hurts and just talking about any of this is hard and like again, even like this, is like our a little bit of escape, right? And it should not be escape. We should be talking about these things. It's something that should be always on the top of our mind. But just going to just South Korea for a second is that it? I mean, again, they're the government is basically telling people not to go to PC bongs. Like most of them are closed, so I don't want to go straight into like numbers and PC bongs. It's a it's a good tease. It's the best we have in South Korea for number-wise, but when most of them are closed and and basically the government and people are telling kids not to go there, it's not the best representation. Also, if Riot, you know, does activations like, hey, uh, you get a free skin if you play the PC bong, or all the agents are unlocked if you go to the PC bong like they did with League of Legends, I would bet you the numbers will rise up dramatically. So I do think they need like an OGN style event to really push it to the next level. But I think it's an okay start. As you said, it's a soft launch. We'll see how it goes. I think overall, the launch was pretty successful. I think that the esports scene will really tell us how far it can go. I think mm -hmm. as a casual game, it will be semi-successful. It'll be, as a casual game, similar to Apex Legends, where you'll have your casual streamers in a pretty good audience. But if this game really wants to compete with the CSGOs and Dotas and League of Legends of the world, it needs to be a big esport. We'll see how that goes. So. For more content, you can check out our YouTube channel. We had a 12-hour live stream, pretty much all the content there, interviews with pros, interviews with the developers, with the head of eSports, a meta conversation, including uh, so much more. You can find that on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash ESPN eSports. This program is every Thursday night, the ESPN eSports Valorant show. It begins at 8 p.m. Eastern. If you're also a fan of the other Riot Games title League of Legends. We have Rift Rewind every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. And tomorrow night, Emily Rand has the LPL show followed by Trivia Night. If you're looking to unwind and just have some fun on a Friday night, you can feel free to join us for Trivia Night. But for Valorant fans, every Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you next week.